what you're seeing there are, are five glass tubes in which um, uh, Neospora were um, inoculated and they're growing from left to right. And every 24 hours they go through a canidiation rhythm, which you can see there with the um, uh, uh, the, uh, the the sprouting structures um, that, and that allows you to define um, the periodicity and that's been very extensively used um, for classic early genetic studies. Um, here's the movement of beans um, which um, are under um, very tight um, circadian control. If you keep beans in the dark they will still undergo changes in the um, appearance of their leaves due to changes in turga. Um, in the structure of the plant, with a nice 24-hour rhythm. Um, Drosophila insects show 24-hour rhythms of behavior, but also the closure, that's hatching, um, which is shown um, here in this, this pattern here. And I can tell a little bit more about Drosophila in a couple of minutes. And of course, uh, mammals. Um, and I started out my interest in clocks working on these animals here, the uh, Syrian hamster. And these animals are, of course, are nocturnal and undergo um, very marked changes in activity over the 24-hour period. And if you give them a wheel, they'll run in it. And for those of you that um, might be interested in this, a typical Syrian hamster, which weighs about 110, 120 grams, will run about seven miles um, in one night, every night for about a year, if you give it a wheel. Um, so it's quite, they're quite spectacularly addicted um, to wheels if you provide them with them and extremely active and it's highly um, coordinated activity with a very strong periodicity to it. Clocks themselves, we now know, um, go back at least um, two and a half billion years. And I suspect many of us do that it's actually much earlier than that, but that's as far back as we can push it because that's where we see the... Um, the bacterial clock genes emerging as, as a lineage um, associated with the um, so-called great oxidation event um, that occurred um, early in the um, evolution of life. And uh, clocks have been around in bacteria for um, that length of time. The next group of organisms in which um, uh, uh, clocks appeared, uh, probably plants and then fungi, um, animal clock genes probably um, appeared about one billion years ago, um, shown on this scale of things. And right at the end, in a tiny microscopically thin sliver, we've got the um, evolution of hominids. So these are really um, remarkably ancient processes and really fundamental to the biology of the cell um, at the single cell level and retain their function as cells became more complex and perform multicellular organisms and more advanced structures. So to work properly, um, a clock has to have the capacity internally uh, to undergo self-sustained oscillations. Um, and it has to be able to retain a period um, reliably of around about 24 hours, hence the word um, circadian has to be entrainable by the environment. There's no point if the clock is simply autistic and doesn't respond to any external stimuli. And the vast majority of clocks, and I'm gonna give you one example in nature where this um, is not the case, but the vast majority of clocks are entrained by light. So the study of clocks um, and the study of photoreceptors has become kind of inextricably um, interlocked. And a clock is no use unless it does something, it's got to drive um, output rhythms. And in the case of um, mammals, uh, uh, the photoreceptors are in the eye, and I'm going to tell you more about that shortly, um, which entrains a clock in the brain. And um, that um, clockwork mechanism uh, entrained initially in the brain is responsible for synchronizing rhythms um, throughout um, all body organs. And we can say quite safely now that pretty well every cell in our body and that of all other vertebrates has got a self-sustained circadian oscillator running within it. And the behavior is organized um, in a, um, uh, in a, excuse me one minute, I just move this over here, um, in a um, very uh, stereotypical fashion in, in many organisms. And here's um, an example of two organisms, one of which is um, uh, diurnal, that's uh, the fruit fly shown here which shows um, 
uh, profound activity during the day, but with marked increases at the beginning of the light cycle and at the end of the light cycle. And here's a nocturnal rodent. Most mammals are nocturnal, and all, virtually all rodents are. And um, this animal is um, showing uh, activity confined to the dark period. And the point about this is that if you keep these organisms in light-dark cycles, the activity becomes entrained because light, light has imprisoned the clockwork mechanism and is resetting it subtly each day so that it maintains synchrony to the external world. But if you put these org organisms such as fruit flies or, or mammals into continuous darkness, which is shown at this point here, um, the clock now free runs. And you can see that this Drosophila clock is running slightly shorter than 24-hour um, periods, it's around about 23.6. And this is a mouse clock. This is a, um, a C57 mouse, I think. And uh, despite the white color of that individual down there, I think it is a C57. And they run with um, a period of about 23.7 hours. And this is genetically determined. So different strains of mice have got subtly different periods. If we look in our own case, and uh, that of mammalian sleep, um, the, um, the sleep-wake cycle um, is controlled by, um, now known to be controlled by two separate processes, um, one of which is the um, uh, accumulation um, of a sleep debt, um, which is shown on the left-hand side here, and the other of which, um, my apologies, um, is associated with the dissipation of that sleep debt. And there's a so-called circadian gating mechanism, which allows that um, uh, sleep deficit to be accumulated and then lost. And that gating mechanism is controlled by the circadian clock. And this, of course, is the um, sine qua non of, uh, of jet lag. If you fly across time zones, you will accumulate a sleep debt, but you won't actually be able to sleep because the gate in this um, process is not open and it takes days and days and days um, uh, to, to, to reset. And um, many of us would have um, suffered from that um, particular frustration. I'm not gonna say anything more about sleep. I will come to that um, in the next um, time I, I talk to you when I talk about the immune system. So we'll just leave that on the side. But here's a, a classic early example of um, human <clears throat> sleep wake cycles. And it's it comes from studies by um, a pioneer in our field, a, a German scientist, uh, Jürgen Aschoff, um, who um, managed to persuade um, medical students, he was a, a doctor, um, to uh, go into isolation and allow him to make measurements of their um, body temperature rhythms, their sleep weight rhythms, and their, their feeding behavior. And what this shows is the pattern of sleep um, in um, uh, an individual mapped out over a period of about 40 to 50 days. And at the top, the first 10 days, the person's in uh, a natural environment um, with a light dark cycle exposed. And the solid line is when the individual's asleep and the dotted line is when this individual is awake. And the triangles are when the individual's minimal body temperature occurs. Each person had um, in, uh, it was telemetered for um, body temperature. And the body temperature rhythms are parked um, close to the end of the, or the latter part of the um, sleep, sleep cycle. So you, our body temperature minimums around about four o'clock in the morning. And then when this person was put into um, free running conditions with no exposure to an external light dark cycle in constant conditions, you can see now the internal clockwork has taken over and this person's free running with a period actually slightly longer than 24 hours. And interestingly, the body temperature rhythm has now parked itself right at the beginning of the sleep cycle rather than at the end of the sleep cycle. This is a process known as internal um, desynchrony. And it's a subject to um, quite a lot of um, interesting research into which areas are involved in controlling the sleep, controlling body temperature and um, metabolism. And when the person is returned back to a 24 hour period, you can see that the body temperature rhythm parks itself back to a normal um, position in the cycle, but it takes about um, six to eight days um, to um, really fully reset. 
And that's really the story of um, jet lag. That's how long it takes if you experience um, a major clock shift um, to reestablish um, the phase of your um, internal body clock. And for those of you that have had the um, joy of um, <laughs> young children in the house um, uh, and uh, trying to get to sleep at night with a baby that won't, um, you might be amused to know that babies very often got um, very good um, circadian clocks, but they just run with exceptionally aberrant periods. And this is um, a classic study by um, Nathaniel Kleitman, who was the first to make these observations here, um, of a newborn baby's um, circadian clock. And you can see this one's running um, really very slow. And it wasn't until this particular child got to about 16 weeks of age that the um, clock um, entrained to a, uh, a normal 24-hour periodicity. And I think we, many of us have been through this experience of saying, at last, we've got the, the child to sleep at night. And in fact, what's happening is the child is drifting across your night period, night period and then going back into the day and then coming back into the night period. And it can take quite a variable time. There's been quite a lot of research um, since this um, looking at um, differences and, and, and how long it takes um, circadian clocks in young children um, to fully synchronize and reset. So um, if you're um, uh, looking for the origin of the neural clock, um, we think we have a strong candidate in the brain as a, as a central neural pacemaker. And that's a structure in the uh, ventral hypothalamus, which um, is linked to the eyes through the optic chiasm. And it's shown in, in two forms here. On, on the left-hand side, you've got um, a cartoon of the brain itself seen from below with the optic chiasm. And uh, on the right-hand side, um, there's a reminder that there's a um, direct retinal link between um, this structure, the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the retina. And that's a, um, a monosynaptic link, by which I mean there's a um, single cell, a cell body in the eye and a long single synapse that transmits all the way to the, um, to the brain. Whoops. Sorry, it's super sensitive. Um, I just touched the mouse um, uh, using the cursor um, uh, here. And what I'm gonna show you now is a cartoon, a, a film rather made by a, a colleague of mine. Um, I think I am. Here we go. Um, this is a brain scan. And that's a colleague, Michael Hastings, who I've been working with for many years. And I'll show you one little bit of data from our, our work in, in a minute. Um, this is his own brain been scanned, there are his eyes. There's the optic chiasm. And there's his SCN. So not um, too many of us get the chance to um, have our brain scan like that, um, but that gives you a little, a little bit of a feel for it. And we now know that this um, pacemaker mechanism in the brain is, is simply um, a conductor or an entrainer for um, multiple rhythms uh, throughout the body. And pretty well every cell in the body um, contains an autonomous clock. And if you take um, the, that structure, the SCN, and you make a transgenic mouse, and this is from some um, earlier work that we did, um, and you put a fluorescent tag on that, you can see the um, uh, 10, 10 to 100,000 cells in this structure, the SCN, um, ticking away. Um, and in fact, you can keep these going for several months in culture in, in a dish. And that particular brain structure will keep ticking and keep um, a, a periodicity of around about uh, 24 hours. So the central pacemaker in the um, hypothalamus is really important in advanced vertebrates, including mammals, um, in maintaining circadian synchrony um, with the outside world. So just quickly before I leave humans, a couple of um, quick uh, stories. Um, the first is um, what happens when we go to um, extreme environments. 
And as you know, um, we and other nations maintain um, permanent bases um, in the Antarctic region. And uh, people have to work down there um, throughout the year, including, of course, the prolonged um, polar night. And on the left hand side there, you can see um, a, a raster plot for um, the polar night in, in the middle of the winter for one individual, uh, which shows the activity period and rest period of this, this individual over a period of um, many months. And you'll see that the activity pattern has got strange shifts in it of a week. And that's because, I do apologize, this um, mouse here is extraordinarily sensitive. Um, you'll see that this, um, you've got these shifts every um, uh, month or two. And the reason for that is that you have to have um, people on fire watch at night because fire is one of the biggest um, potential hazards in those uh, environments. And that's why this person's activity is um, so shifted. Um, but you'll also note that uh, this individual, and there were many examples in this study, show um, quite tight um, uh, uh, entrainment to a 24-hour period. And the reason for that is that um, the British Antarctic Survey, as many of the other national centers, uh, maintain a strict regime on the lighting cycle during the um, polar night so that people um, are exposed to um, rigid light cycles which entrains their internal clockwork so that everybody on the base maintains circadian harmony and synchrony and gets up at the same time and goes to bed at the same time in fact there's a clock on the wall in the headquarters in um, Maddingley Cambridge which actually tells you if you go there um, what time of day it is down in Antarctica in terms of um, whether people are asleep or awake at night. And a few years ago, um, uh, uh, Greenpeace decided to keep an eye on the activities of um, some of the um, uh, Western governments, including um, the British base, and established a small base um, uh, on the Antarctic mainland. In fact, it was a converted um, lorry container, which they'd insulated the inside of. The mine just boggles as to um, how difficult that would have been to live in. And four individuals um, occupied this, and an Australian colleague of mine um, managed to persuade um, this group of um, volunteers to keep um, sleep records and activity records over the Antarctic winter. And you can see that as the autumn progresses, all of these four individuals are quite synchronous, but when the sun dipped below the horizon for the last time, um, each individual started to display um, uh, free running rhythms with different periods and, syn and synchrony to that of the others within the, with, within the group. Now, um, at the end of the summer, the winter rather, uh, the light came back and you can now see that all of these individuals are perfectly entrained. So the main difference between these two sites is that the Antarctic survey on the left was maintained on a rigid lighting schedule with a 24 hour period to it, whereas the one on the right had no internal control over the lighting. It was left to the individuals as to when they turn lights on or off. The interesting thing about this, these were French um, volunteers, by the way, um, is that um, it consisted of one female volunteer and three males, all living in one lorry container converted <laughs> down, down on the Antarctic mainland. And um, halfway through the um, winter, apparently, the female one, the, the female member shacked up with the leader, who is this individual here. And I think you can probably see that they're now running synchronously. You can probably detect um, when that when that um, event occurred. It's very naughty of me to say that, but I, I do happen to know that um, the synchrony of these two groups was associated with um, a different sort of relationship. So I'll just I'll park that thought for you um, and, and leave it. So just uh, a final um, comment about, uh, about humans is um, the uh, more recent work in which um, we've looked at variation in um, sleep timing and the propensity of individuals to get up early in the morning or late in the morning and how these uh, events change at, at, at weekends. And you're probably familiar with the um, 
clever um, circadian questionnaires that have now been devised to tease out information on um, whether you are a so-called lark or an owl, shown in this cartoon here. And uh, a <clears> colleague <throat> of mine in um, Germany, in Munich, has uh, uh, done a wonderful study in which he's looked at um, how the chronotype, how your propensity to get up early in the morning or late in the morning, changes over life. And he's looked at it in um, uh, women and in men. And you can see here that um, as you go from youth, about the age of 10, up into your teens, um, you tend to have a later and later chronotype, which basically means you get up later and you go to bed later. But you'll see there's a marked difference between the two sexes, and it's much more marked in, um, in young men than it is in young women. And any of you who have had um, uh, children um, uh, and uh, may, well have, uh, may well have noticed this, <laughs> this phenomenon. And then the propensity to get up um, earlier um, uh, increases with age. And until you get out to sort of my age, somewhere around here, won't be too specific about that if you like. And you can see that um, this um, chronotype drops throughout life um, by several hours. So that um, by the time you get into your 60s and 70s, you find yourself quite cheerfully getting up at five o'clock in the morning and uh, going to bed at around um, nine o'clock in the evening. And the two sexes um, cross over at around about the age of um, 55. Um, that's uh, therefore, if you want to have the ideal age for marriage, that's where the, the two chronotypes occur here. Um, that's when um, a, a female is around about 28 and the man's around about 40. That's the ideal point at which you can have breakfast together and not be equally tired. I'm joking. And perfect harmony occurs much later in life, <laughs> about the age of 55. But there is a very marked sexual dimorphism in the um, phasing of the internal clock as it entrains the light dark cycle. And chronotype changes quite markedly um, over life. <clears throat> so just two comments about the so-called genetic revolution, and I'll mention this in, in the next time we meet, if, if you wish. And um, this was started by um, this man here, um, uh, Seymour Benzer. And um, Seymour Benzer, back in the 1960s, he started out life as a um, physicist, and he decided that he wanted to take on biology. And he was very interested in genetics, and he was aware of the earlier studies by um, biologists, principally in the States, who had used um, mutagenesis studies to map out genes using linkage analysis. And he decided very bravely that he was going to study the genetics of behavior. And it was um, regarded as an impossible problem. Behavior was thought to be too difficult to dissect genetically, and there weren't any good assays. Um, but he persisted, and with the assistance of um, another um, uh, member, of the, member of the lab, um, uh, Ron Konopka, who's the first author on this um, particular paper, um, they set about mutagenizing Drosophila and then studying their behavior in the laboratory. And many of you will know this story, but they uncovered um, a number of mutations in Drosophila, which um, they subsequently mapped um, to the same gene. These are all variants of one gene. And in the um, wild type at the top here, you've got the um, normal free running um, rhythm, which is close to 24 hours. Um, then in this form of the gene, you've got a short period mutation. And in this form of the gene, you've got a long period mutation. And this is a null allele in which you have got um, a, a dysfunction of the gene and the um, individual is not running with any kind of obvious entrainment to the light dark cycle whatsoever. And this paper was published in 1971 in PNAS. And I think picked up something like a half a dozen citations in the first year and maybe 15 or 20 in the second or third year, there's been an interesting analysis of this particular paper, um, because for many years it was just parked there as um, an unusual observation, a one-off, and but it did attract the attention of uh, 
several groups, including um, two in the States, one based in Brandeis, which are the two colleagues to the um, left, that's Jeff Hall and Michael Roshbash, and one in Rockefeller, that's um, um, Mike Young. And uh, these two groups um, set about trying to clone the, um, the gene that was invo involved in this behavior, and they succeeded. And with that, they uncovered the most wonderful um, uh, new genetics, um, which led to an extraordinary explosion of interest in the field. And as you will probably know, or, or you can see it from the slide, but <laughs> you may already know, um, won them the Nobel Prize for Medicine back in uh, 2017. And it's been a, a great pleasure of mine and many colleagues to have worked with these people and um, to have known them and um, seen those early days um, reach um, such a remarkable fruition. This is not what I'm going to tell you about, but that's just a little cartoon of some of the elements now that we know are involved in um, driving this Akkadian clock. And that's all I'm going to say. You're never going to see that figure again unless you're obsessed with the um, genetics and, and um and follow it professionally. So the next question is um, how the eye uh, regulates this um, clockwork mechanism. Um, we know um, in mammals that the eye is absolutely essential to this process. If you remove the eye, um, uh, no mammal is able to entrain normally to any kind of lighting cycle. We believe that the only um, functional photoreceptors in mammals um, operate through the eye and in particular through the, through the retina. And classically, the um, major photoreceptors in the eye are the rods and cones, which are shown here in this, in, in this cartoon uh, at the back of the eye. But um, while the loss of rods and cones um, leads to complete blindness, and you can show this in, in laboratory mice, for instance, with um, genetic studies in which you can knock out the rod and the cone proteins and the cells that um, encode them, uh, you can show that these animals are completely blind, but they still have normal entrainment to light. And yet when you remove the eyes, they cease to entrain to the light dark cycle. So the circadian clock is driven by another cell type that exists um, within the retina. Now, just to um, give uh, a little bit more background onto this before I tell you a bit more detail on the specific story, we now believe that the um, mammalian group, the mammalian lineage, um, being about 150 million years old, about two thirds of its time, um, uh, vertebrate life was dominated by diurnal reptiles and early mammals were therefore nocturnal. And they were trapped in what's now called the uh, nocturnal bottleneck. So much of the um, early ancestry of the mammalian group, including ourselves, um, is still reflected in the fact that um, this group of organisms evolved um, in a largely nocturnal um, environment. And if you are living in a nocturnal environment, um, you want to be able to detect rather small changes in a radiance at the dawn and the dusk to entrain your activity to the nocturnal zone. And you need a very sensitive photo detector. And by far the most sensitive um, radiance detector um, is the retina. Um, and mammals have therefore emphasized retinal, ent retinal entrainment as the mechanism to entrain the circadian clock. And I'm not going to go into it this evening, but this is a rather aberrant and unusual feature amongst the vertebrates. Um, all other vertebrates um, have got photosensitive structures in other parts of the brain, which are directly entrained by light and can respond to light dark cycles in the absence of the eyes. But that's not the case in, in mammals. So we think the nocturnal origin of mammals has um, come about um, uh, has, has led to the um, e evolution of the, um, the retina as the primary photosensor um, in the system. Furthermore, um, most mammals retain a nocturnal eye shape. They've got larger corneal diameters relative to the uh, axial length of the eye. And uh, binocular vision, which is a, um, a specially mammalian trick, evolved um, to increase um, light capture. And during this um, 
period of the um, nocturnal bottleneck, um, mammals seem to have lost um, a large number of the critical photoreceptive proteins, at least eight opsins, um, I think. I can't see the top of this screen. I think it's eight. Yes, at least eight opsins have, um, uh, have been lost evolutionarily compared to other um, vertebrates. And there's a few of them down there um, on the right, um, down at the bottom um, shown. So um, other vertebrate groups, um, in particular fishes and amphibians, um, have got a plethora of um, uh, opsins, which we just simply lack. So we've had to rebuild um, our visual system as, as, a, as a group, mammalian group, um, from rather um, uh, a limited stock of um, options. So here's um, some of the um, uh, practical evidence that um, uh, there's a non-visual photoreceptor sitting in the retina, which is important in the um, entrainment of the clock. And this is um, an actogram, a wheel running um, activity pattern of a laboratory mouse um, in which the rods and the cone system have been genetically ablated um, in this animal. So it is completely blind. And you can see that, um, first of all, it entrains to a light dark cycle. And then when it's placed in uh, permanent darkness, it free runs with a period of around about 23.7 um, hours. And then if you give it a light pulse, which is what that yellow blob shows, um, the, uh, the clock shifts, it resets in a predictable fashion um, and is delayed with onset um, the, the next circadian cycle. And that's how the clock entrains to the light dark cycle. So this is some um, sine on evidence that there has to be another photoreceptor in the eye. And the prize for the discovery of that went to a young American scientist, Iggy Provencio, who used um, the, the frog, um, this is the, the melanophore, the, um, the light detecting cells on the skin of the frog. And um, these cells um, uh, 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 can be grown in culture. And he used genetic methods to identify a photopigment um, within these um, cells, which causes um, skin blanching of frogs when they're exposed to light. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you go out at night with a torch and you find a frog and you shine the torch on it, you can see quite rapidly that its skin um, changes in color as the melanophores contract um, within the, um, the skin itself. And those cells are directly light sensitive. And what he was able to show was that this protein called melanopsin was also present in mammals. And in particular, it was present in the retina. And in contrast to the uh, photoreceptors, it's present in the um, ganglion cells at the front of the eye, which is shown here. And these are the so-called intrinsically photoreceptive ganglion cells. Not every ganglion cell has got melanopsin <laughs> in it, but you can see um, down here, for instance, uh, there's one example here, and that's um, uh, a calcium um, uh, transient shown in that cell following exposure to light from a paper by um, Summer Hatter. And an analogy of what this um, system is like is rather like dewdrops on the spider's web, which is shown below, which is that light passes through this um, filter system to the um, main photoreceptors on the back of the eye, the rods and the cones, and it informs um, the, the brain as to whether light is present. And there is now known to be a, a fascinating neural link between those um, retinal ganglion cells through the optic chiasm into the SCN. And this actually shows the, the tracking of this um, in, in a mouse retina. You can see the cell body shown here in circle, going right back um, into the, um, uh, the base of the retina um, and into the optic chiasm uh, towards the SCN. And if you knock out the gene for, I do apologize, knock out the gene for, um, You knock out the gene for um, melanopsin and also um, the rods and the cones, it's then and only then that you see in the mouse that it's unable to entrain to a light dark cycle and uh, free runs. So this discovery of um, an additional photoreceptor system um, tells us that um, 
the, the eye does more than just um, respond um, uh, to light in a visual sense. It's got a non-visual um, uh, role in terms of entraining the circadian clock. And from this, we've now gone on um, to look in other vertebrate groups as to how brain and other cell types are entrained by different classes of photoreceptor. And it's become really very complicated because uh, in the mammalian lineage, the number of photoreceptors has been greatly reduced. But in um, other groups, in particular in amphibians and fishes, um, there are very large numbers and they all appear to contribute to one to a greater or lesser extent the entrainment um, of the circadian clock in peripheral tissues. And here's a practical example in, in humans of um, photoreception. Um, this is a person who is um, completely um, visually blind and is unable to um, uh, see in any kind of conventional sense. And yet, um, there are, I think there are two individuals in this particular um, example here. You can see that um, both of these individuals are able to entrain um, well to a light-dark cycle, and particularly the individual <laughs> on the right. And um, subsequent studies have shown that the, um, the internal clockwork of these individuals can be reset by shifting the um, phase of the light-dark cycle. So this is a little bit of evidence that um, this system um, that I've just described to you is important in, in our own species. And as the, um, the retinal system controlling rods and cones may degenerate with age leading to blindness, importantly, um, the retinal ganglion system may well be intact and still capable of entraining individuals um, to a normal light-dark cycle and hence a normal life. So that's um, enough on that. I'm going to just say a quick thing or two about um, migration. And i um, going to just tell you the um, story of, uh, of um, the willow warbler, because this was really the, the organism that helped to break open a really remarkable um, additional feature of um, biological timing. And this is the annual migratory rhythm of the um, willow warbler. At the top, you can see the changes in the length of the day. And this is one of um, the many organisms, actually virtually all organisms, uh, uh, use um, the photoperiod cycle to entrain um, their physiology. And at the bottom there, you can see the expression of migratory rhythms, which is rhythmical behavior which um, reflects the propensity of the animal to migrate. The Germans have a wonderful word for it, for which we have no direct, easy translation. It's Zugunru, which means migratory restlessness. And you can see that the migratory restlessness in the willow warbler peaks in the autumn and again in April. And you're gonna see why it's um, biphasic in a minute. This also shows two molt cycles, which is rather unusual um, amongst birds. And here's um, a laboratory study in which willow warblers were kept um, in natural light dark cycles. And when this migratory restlessness um, starts to occur, um, the animal switches from being um, diurnal to being nocturnal. And you can see that's occurred about one third of the way down this um, particular um, actogram. So there's a shift in the um, behavior of the animal, which is driven by um, a seasonal clock. And to cut to the chase, we now think that there's an internal timing mechanism of this animal that's driven by an annual clockwork mechanism, um, but that it's also able to integrate um, changes in photoperiod, the length of the day, along with knowledge of lines of magnetic force. Um, and it uses um, uh, magnetism in order to orientate itself in an appropriate manner. And the evidence from this came from uh, remarkable studies in a planetarium, which was um, artificially set up to um, study the, um, uh, the, the behavior of uh, captive um, warblers um, without any ability to see um, what was going on in the outside world. On the right-hand side, you can see the natural um, migratory pattern of warblers from central Germany across the Straits of Gibraltar, and then down into um, Central and Southern Africa. 
Um, and this occurs between September and November. And that's the, 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 the first period of migratory restlessness that I showed you in the earlier figure. And then in the spring, they migrate north again, back out of Africa, again, straight across the Mediterranean, um, back into um, Central Europe. And what you're seeing on the left are the uh, vector plots of um, this animal here, the, the willow warbler, um, which, uh, and what, what the group did was to put um, perches right round the inside of the, the large cages they kept these animals in and put magnetic switches under each perch so they could work out in which direction the animal was most active. And in, the, in September, the animal shows most of its hopping activity in a um, southwesterly direction. That flips in November to a southeasterly direction, and again in May to a northeasterly direction. So the um, angle of behavior within this entirely artificial system um, is a reflection of the full natural migration. And what the group then went on to do, and I'm not gonna show you the data, is to um, put very, very small um, um, magnetic um, structures on the heads of these animals and were able to completely disrupt this orientation behavior. So they have a, a clockwork mechanism that controls the seasonality of this process and the orientation according to the time of year is determined by um, detecting um, lines of magnetic inclination, so-called um, paleomagnetism. And this phenomenon of a combination of a light dark cycle driven clock and a magnetic um, orientation mechanism is now um, becoming quite widely recognized in nature. And um, this is the next species in which it was um, most beautifully demonstrated by a colleague, Steve Rappert. This is the famous monarch butterfly migration from uh, in the United States. There are two populations, one um, to the west of the rock is one to the east. And the pattern of movement of these um, animals from the, um, uh, from the north to the south and then back up again in the following spring is driven by um, conceptually a very similar clockwork mechanism to that that I've uh, described uh, in the bird. But what this group has then gone on to be able to do is to identify the, the specific cell types in the antennae and in the brain that control the response to light versus the response to magnetism. And it's one of the most beautiful and, and complex stories in biology in the field of migration, um, but it would take um, a, a long time to run through it. So um, I'm gonna come to hibernation in a, in a tick, but um, just one other important feature of that um, circadian clockwork mechanism is still the case that the majority of mammals are nocturnal. And um, this is the, uh, the flying squirrel. And uh, this animal lives in burrows um, deep in trees. And you can put light sensors in there and show that the level of illumination within these burrows is remarkably low. And this shows the emergence time of um, an individual flying squirrel measured over the course of uh, a year um, by uh, an American colleague, Pat DeCourcy who uh, was able to um, track the time of emergence relative to the onset of darkness, which is shown, um, uh, sorry, the dark light cycle, which is shown in, in, a, um, uh, in the dotted line there. That's the, that's the photo period. And from this, she was able to compute just how much light on an average day um, these animals are actually exposed to. And it turned out to be just a few seconds. And in fact, over the course of the entire year, the animal was able to entrain itself to the external light dark cycle by continuously resetting its clock so that it maintained itself in the dark phase of the light dark cycle with minimal exposure to light. And the annual exposure to light in these animals can be measured in just a matter of a few hours. And that's very much the feature of many nocturnal animals that they maintain themselves in the nocturnal zone, even though the um, light period itself is changing, by resetting in response to light and parking their, their activity cycle back in the dark phase of the um, light dark cycle. And then their internal clock slowly drifts until they expose themselves to light again and they quickly reset back again. 
Um, so this is the phenomenon of, of, of light sampling. And it means that um, quite typically, you will never actually see many nocturnal species unless you go out in the dark with um, light detecting, uh, the infrared detecting equipment, um, because they've got a perfectly adapted biology um, that allows them to maintain um, themselves completely in the dark. So life in perpetual darkness. Um, one quick example, then we'll come to hibernation. Um, this is the, um, the story of cave fish. Um, and um, this has been worked on largely by Nick Fox at the University of Tübingen and um, uh, two other groups, one in, one in Britain. Um, but this is, this is um, a, a, a story that um, he evolved. And to start the story, um, this is the zebra fish, which is kind of the laboratory mouse of the, of the fish world. And years ago, Nick was able to show that every cell in the body of a zebra fish had a light entrainable clock. So it had a photoreceptor in it, it had a free running clock in it and was able to entrain to the external world. So unlike mammals, um, there's no need for a hierarchical arrangement through the eye and the brain. The entire body is translucent to light and responsive. And um, Nick then went on to show that if you take um, cells from these animals and you put a reporter for one of the clock genes, that's the period gene, same gene that was discovered in Drosophila um, all those years ago, and you can see that um, these cells in culture um, are beautifully rhythmic in response to a light dark cycle. And if you change the phase of the light cycle, which is shown at the bottom, you get um, an antiphasic expression of this, um, this gene uh, per one. So this is just telling us that the um, clockwork genetic mechanisms are um, ticking away beautifully and persistently um, at the individual cell level, and that these cells are directly light responsive and don't need the eyes um, to entrain them. But some species of fish um, uh, live in the absence of exposure to light, uh, the cave fish. And um, in the case of the um, Somalian cave fish, um, they thought, they're thought to have lived in um, these environments for between 1.6 to 2.4 million years. And they've lost all photopigments. Um, the eye has been, um, is completely lost within a, um, a day and a half of fertilization. There's a greatly reduced optic tectum. And there's very little evidence at all that these organisms are capable of responding to a light dark cycle. Here's a little bit of the behavioral data. There's a zebra fish on the left. Um, entrained to a light dark cycle. That's the activity patterns of a zebra fish. On the right, there's the Somali cave fish, which is completely um, incapable of responding to any kind of light dark cycle. And if you measure the activity of clock genes, we don't need to go into what, what they, they specifically are or do. You can see that they're rhythmic in the zebra fish in response to a light dark cycle. And they're pretty well flatlined in the case of the Somali cave fish. But it turns out uh, uh, that these animals, and this is true probably for many of the cave fish, actually do have perfectly good um, circadian rhythms. They're just not sensitive to light. But what they are sensitive to is feeding. And in the cave environment, um, food and nutrients may still come through the cave system in a rhythmic manner. And if you entrain the um, food supply to these animals, you can entrain rhythmic behavior uh, quite beautifully and then reset those clock gene rhythms that I've just shown you um, so that they now, now show very nice 24-hour um, light patterns. So this is one of the best examples in um, vertebrates as to uh, of an organism which has escaped from the influence of light but still retains um, a clockwork mechanism driving its um, internal biology. But in this case, it's set by metabolism and uh, metabolic cues. So finally, um, life in the cold. And um, these are the Arctic uh, ground squirrels, which we've been working on for a few years with colleagues um, in Alaska. And in the background there, you can see the, uh, the Brooks Range. They live north of the Brooks Range um, in the continuous permafrost zone. Uh, 
the that's down below about a meter. Um, the annual air temperature there is about minus 10. Um, there's a plant growing season, which runs from the, about the 1st of June to the um, middle of August, if, if you're lucky. And these animals are really the princes of all hibernators. They can hibernate for eight or more months um, a year. And the timing of their entrance into hibernation and exit from hibernation is timed with um, quite extraordinary uh, precision. Um, this uh, animal there, um, by the way, is probably a male because that's a very male-like posture. The males come out of hibernation much earlier than the females. And I'll show you um, a little bit more detail on that in a minute and um, defend territories from uh, against other males so that when the females emerge, they can mate with them, usually on the day or shortly after, um, day after emergence, so that the female becomes pregnant um, very rapidly um, once she becomes, uh, once she comes above ground and leaves the hibernation state. So some of this work was done with um, my friend Corey Williams, um, who was then based in the University of Fairbanks in Alaska. And this is a trip I made um, with him um, to uh, catch and tag um, Arctic ground squirrels. And you can, you can fit these animals up with um, some pretty clever telemetry around the neck, which detects light and activity and some physiological parameters as well. And if anybody is worried about the impact that this might have on the animal, they're very easy to recatch and you can remove this um, from them. And the reason for that is that they absolutely love carrots, which is what you're seeing at the top in the in the bait box. So you put the, um, uh, the, the, the squirrel trap at the entrance to the hole, the squirrel comes out, it eats the carrots and it gets caught. Um, some squirrels get so fond of carrots that if you've got five or six um, traps set around um, the colony um, and you catch the animal and weigh it and put it back into the ground again. It comes up again, as that's shown on the bottom right, in a different hole, immediately finds another um, uh, trap, goes straight into it just to get the carrots and then it has to be released from that trap. So they are, in the jargon, very trap happy, um, uh, relatively quite easy to catch um, in, in the field. During hibernation, um, these sorts of animals, the true hibernators, go into a deep state of torpor. And that's a very typical posture in a hibernating animal with its nose tucked in a circle. And if you watch a hibernating animal in a hibernaculum, this is obviously in a laboratory environment where they've got cold chambers set up, um, it can it can take an extraordinarily long time before you see the animal breathing. It's a very shallow breath, about once every um, minute or so in these cases. But to all intents and purposes, they look like um, they're dead. This shows the um, free running rhythm of one individual female in the field um, based on telemetric devices that were fitted to the animal and um, used to monitor um, its behavior over a two year period. And at the top of the figure, you can see the normal euthermic state when it's um, uh, normally active above ground and has got a body temperature of about 37, 38. And as it approaches the hibernation season, its body temperature drops. You can see it's dropping just a little bit here. In fact, if you were to blow that up, what you're seeing is the animal's undergoing test drops. It'll drop down by about four to five degrees and then about an hour or two later, um, or a few hours later, come back up to normal thermi. And it repeats this, these test drops until it gets to a point where it will spontaneously um, uh, drop body temperature and it will plateau out at the bottom um, close to that of the ambient soil temperature. Now, this process of um, cooling is associated with the um, active um, switching off of thermogenesis. So it looks like the way these animals lose heat is to um, switch off thermogenic processes um, within the body. And there's a whole um, biochemical story and a mechanism behind that. We now have some um, really good new understandings to how that um, process actually works. You'll see that uh, the animal then bottoms out um, Sorry about this super sensitive mouse. Bottom, bottoms out 
um, in this case, at around about two degrees, cent two degrees uh, centigrade. And um, as the ground temperature drops, which is not shown in this figure, um, the animal's body temperature drops with the ground temperature, but the ground temperature can drop down to minus 10. And the animal um, drops its own body temperature down to about minus two, at which point it is super cool. If it was to go more than half a degree or three quarters of a degree lower than that point, it would freeze to a block of ice. So this tells us something else really important about hibernation, which is that during the um, process of torpor, the animal is actively defending its body temperature. And we know that it does that by continuous activation of brown adipose tissue to a small extent, just lighting a very, very small um, amount of fire, if you like, in the system to keep um, body temperature at this critical lower point. And despite what the ground temperature might do, the animal remains locked at about minus two um, throughout the body of the winter. Now you can't help but have noticed that during this process, this animal periodically rewarms around about every um, week or two, 10 days to two weeks over the course of the um, hibernation season. And I'm gonna show you a blow up of that um, in a minute, but that rewarming process really only takes place over about 12 to 18 hours. And it brings itself back up to uh, normal thermi. Now in this case, this animal hibernated for two years and you can see quite typically that it spent eight months of each year underground hibernating and only four months above ground. Uh, this was actually a female, I think, and she would have bred um, during that period above ground um, put on fat, um, created a store for the um, uh, the, the hibernacular, and then gone back underground. A very, very busy time packed into just four months um, of the year. Now, if you look at the um, physiology of hibernating animals during the um, normal thermic period in the, in the summer, uh, the heart rate's around about 300 beats a minute, respiration rate's 150. Um, in torpor, this drops down to um, about three beats a minute, respiration um, for the heart, that respiration rate less than once a minute. Body temperature, it says minus three there, actually the critical lower temperature in these things about minus 2.5. Um, gene function um, is active and ongoing and normal in, in um, the active state, but when they're in torpor, there's no evidence that they undergo any kind of transcriptional or translational activity um, within the cell. That <clears throat> fundamental aspect of cell biology appears to be locked. <clears throat> and if we look at um, neural activity during torpor, the EEG shows pretty well flat line. These are measured at eight degrees centigrade. And in particular in structures such as the hippocampus, it's not possible to see any electrical activity at all um, in a hibernating animal when it's in the, the low temperature state. That's the EMG um, breathing activity shown at the bottom of that trace there, um, which matches the um, pattern of breathing. Now the two sexes have got quite marked differences in um, hibernating strategy. Uh, the, uh, the female will hibernate for considerably longer than the male. Um, the male emerges um, at least a month or more before the female. And both sexes store um, food in the hibernacular um, underground during, uh, which, which is it, which, it, in, in the same hibernacular that they hibernate in. But, they do not eat it during the hibernation season itself. That food is there for the animals to eat um, when they've restored back to normal um, body temperature, but there's still thick snow on the ground. And it's particularly important um, in males. And if the animal's not able to um, develop a store of food the previous autumn, it won't make it, um, it, it in, into the next spring because it won't be able to survive that critical period between the end of hibernation and the melt of the snow and the growth of the, um, the next, next season's plant growth. So about 
80 to 85 percent of the energy costs of hibernation, it's a pretty easy calculation to do, are associated with that rewarming phenomenon that I've just described to you. It's extremely expensive. If they didn't do that, um, a hibernating ground squirrel with the fat reserves it's got on board, and if it maintained itself at um, those very low body temperatures, would be able to hibernate for years um, without any need um, uh, to, 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 to come back out. But uh, hibernators need to store substantial fat reserves prior to hibernation, the bulk of which are used up during that rewarming period um, in hibernation itself. In fact, some run out of reserves and die in their burrows um, in late winter. So it's actually a major um, cause of mortality in these animals is, is late winter mortality. They've just timed it wrong. They haven't got enough fat on board um, and they've um, uh, therefore not made it. As I said, the males arouse first um, and they defend territories and expel other males so that when females emerge, um, they can uh, mate with them. Now, one of the things we're able to do with the Arctic ground squirrel is to fit telemetry devices, which allow us to um, uh, look in detail at the behavior of individuals. And I'm gonna show you, I think in the next slide, um, uh, what you can information you can obtain when you put a light sensor um, around the collar of the animal. And you can see in this blow up at the top, this is a male at the end of the hibernation season shown bracketed um, in A, that um, the animal has ended torpor, but its body temperature is not quite up to normal temperature. It's around about 34, 35 degrees um, uh, centigrade. And males will typically be in this state for a um, week, two, even three weeks. Um, they're conscious, active, but they haven't emerged from the burrow. And they're eating the food that they stored the previous autumn um, as a way of survival. And the bottom left there, you can see the um, circadian activity rhythms of this individual. And it basically the animal is non-rhythmic. Its, its activity patterns are um, consistent throughout the 24 hour period. There's no evidence at all that this animal has got any free running clock driving its biology and its body temperature is lower than that you would normally see um, in a fully euthermic animal. And it's in total darkness throughout this period. And then it starts to emerge um, right at the end shown in that bracket B there and so at this point that you start to see um, the emergence of um, circadian um, rhythms. You can see those on the bottom right hand panel um, with very nice um, activity cycles um, tracking a 24 hour period. And what the light sensor technology tells us, um, these are um, four individuals here, um, is that when the animal is exposed to light, but only when it's exposed to light, um, does that clockwork mechanism start to tick? So shown in red are the um, light the light detectors on the um, the collar um, in, in terms of the presence of light. That's when the animal pokes its head up out of the burrow sufficiently to get exposed to light. And above it in black, you can see on each of these um, the uh, body temperature rhythms. And you can see that for um, these individuals, particularly that one, say at the bottom, bottom left and the bottom right, you can see very nice association between the first exposure to light and the initiation of rhythmic um, uh, body temperature cycles um, shown, in, shown in black. So one interpretation of these observations is that during the um, late hibernation period, just as they're starting to emerge, the animals are in a state of internal circadian chaos. That um, brain eye link um, hasn't been triggered. The internal clockwork of the animal is autistic. So there may well be clocks running in all the cells of the body, but they're not coherent and they're not synchronized to each other. And it's only when the animal is exposed to light that that um, powerful signal through the eye, and the retina, through the SCN is triggered. And that starts to pull together um, all of the other um, major systems of the body, um, leading to the um, very rapid establishment of a uh, coherent 24-hour uh, um, body temperature rhythm. That's 
uh, one um, possible explanation um, uh, for these, these, these data. So hibernating animals um, need to arouse um, every um, two weeks or so. Um, are they really asleep when they're in hibernation? And why on earth do they do this really expensive arousal process? Um, so here are some um, ideas as to why they might arouse. Um, they need to feed or drink, defecate or urinate. They don't. There's no evidence at all that any of that takes place during hibernation. They need to remake their nest. Nope, they don't. Um, they come above ground, have a look around. Nope, they need to stretch, ex do stretch exercises. Nope. Um, and we think now the answer is probably in the brain and that it's neurophysiological. And so really to address this, this is the last two or three slides, we need to look at the challenge that the brain faces at these um, very low temperatures. And the first clue that something interesting was going on came from um, uh, two separate studies. This is um, one of the two, an example of that, um, which looked in detail at what was going on during the process of arousal. And these are EEG measurements of brain activity in um, aroused um, uh, ground squirrels. And what this shows um, is the, the, on the bottom right, you see a blow up um, over 48 hours of that, um, that peak that you're seeing on the left-hand side. So these scales dramatically changed. And what you can see is that there is a um, very intense activity of slow wave sleep that is coincident immediately with the rewarming process the point at which animal gets back up towards normal thermi. And then as the body temperature drops, which is shown um, on the bottom right, I'm a bit reluctant to use the mouse in case <laughs> uh, the slides jump. Um, you can see that the fur temperature is dropping back down to um, the hibernation state. And as the body temperature drops, so that slow wave sleep dissipates. So this led to the really exciting idea that during hibernation, the animal actually becomes sleep deprived. And that one of the possible functions for the um, emergence uh, every two weeks or so was to allow the animal to sleep and undergo the restorative um, function of sleep. And that maybe it was the need to sleep that drove this really expensive but important process um, underpinning the biology uh, of, of these animals. Nice idea. So here's a bit more um, uh, detail on this. This shows um, uh, uh, two individuals. And um, the, the previous one was a European ground squirrel. These are Arctic um, ground squirrels here. And you can see that essentially the same phenomenon occurs in um, different types, the di different sorts of ground squirrels during hibernation, essentially the same biology. Um, uh, the changes in the delta power of the EEG, reflective of um, slow wave sleep. Now, this non REM sleep, um, non rapid eye movement sleep, unlike REM sleep, um, has little to no eye movement during this stage, with um, dreaming being very rare during non REM sleep, but it's known to be critical for the restorative function of sleep on um, nerve cells and um, neural structures. So the idea that hibernating animals um, need to rewarm during hibernation to clear a sleep deficit um, is and was an absolutely beautiful idea. It suggests that at low temperature, the gray brain gradually becomes sleep deprived and suggests that the cause of the arousal is the need to clear that in, um, uh, by rewarming. So is there anything in the idea and what might un be underpinning this remarkable sleep behavior? And a bit more evidence has come from um, neuroanatomical studies um, of the brains of um, hibernating animals and this shows the um, process, uh, which is known as dendritic arborization, 
um, in the hippocampus, which as you may know are the memory centers of the, of the brain. And um, this shows the essential, essentially the extent to which these um, cells um, have, uh, have got these very fine dendritic outgrowths with these little boutons on them. You can see the little connection points shown in triangles on the right hand side indicated um, in a euthermic animal and in a hibernating animal. And in the hibernating animal, um, the, um, these structures um, degenerate. They become shorter, the number of links um, declines significantly, and during um, a hibernation bout, um, the hippocampus undergoes quite substantial um, uh, uh, changes um, in its anatomy and structure. And this has been mapped out by a large number of groups. I picked this example because it's actually the first really good paper in what is a long series that's continuing uh, to this day um, to map out how the brains of these animals change um, during hibernation. Now, um, to cut to the chase, those neural structures, particularly in the hippocampus, hippocampus rebuild dramatically um, within a few hours during that rewarming period. And the brain is therefore highly plastic. And if you measure the extent of dendritic arborization in the hippocampus at the end of a rewarming bout, it's back to the same level that you would see in a normal thermic animal um, in the non-hibernating season. We now think that this phenomenon of sleep is just a correlate of decreased cortical excitation during this important uh, restorative process. It's not the primary causal mechanism, it's just an associate of a much deeper mechanism that's rebuilding brain structure um, during hibernation. And it tells us that um, for the brain at least, and it may be true for many other body organs, um, low temperatures are actually quite dangerous if, you're, if you've evolved as um, a homeothermic mammal and you've pulled off this trick of dropping your body temperature. <clears throat> and one of the structures that's most um, at risk um, appears to be the brain. So from this, we conclude that hibernators aren't actually asleep at low temperatures. It's a mistake to refer to hibernators as, quote, being asleep, particularly animals like ground squirrels. And sleep during the periodic arousals when they're back to normothermy is almost certainly associated with an underlying process of very rapid um, neuronal restoration, but it's not um, in itself causal. So two last slides. The first, sorry, um, getting to Mars. For some reason, this seems to obsess um, uh, space agencies, um, it, 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 it's come back again, of course, um, uh, in the US uh, as an issue. Um, Mars has got a rotation speed of one day, 37 minutes, which is um, beyond the capacity of the normal human circadian clock um, to entrain to. So there's um, one challenge um, if we're going to go into space which is to uh, make sure that we've got some way of addressing the um, important need to in entrain our circadian rhythms um, to the environment into which we're going. And so far, um, there isn't an easy uh, solution to this problem, but NASA has been um, very generous in its support for circadian science over many decades and uh, through to this day. And there's a very good reason for that which is that when you go into space, you know, going around the Earth every eight hours, as the space station does, or going to a planet where the periodicity of the planet is different to that of Earth, um, these systems are important. And um, getting the physiology of the individuals to match or map onto the environment in which they're living is absolutely critical. And the final thing is this um, wonderful film, Alien. I hope everybody's seen it. Um, if you haven't, do go out and dig it out. It's the most thrilling um, space movie ever. And it's absolutely terrifying if you haven't seen it um, before. And there's this um, interesting sequence at the beginning where the um, astronauts, as they are here, um, I think that's John Hurt on the right, um, uh, the astronauts emerge um, from a hibernation state. It, 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 during the film, it becomes apparent that they've been in this state for many, many months. 
at low temperature in this environment. Um, now, of course, this is just the space movie. Um, and uh, so and good fun. But there's a lot of interest in the possibility of hibernation um, in, in humans. And I think the biggest single problem we've got to crack if we do if we find ways of prolonging low temperature in humans for long periods of time is how we deal with what might be an inexorable neurodegenerative process, um, particularly in the species humans, where we don't have any of the clever features that, that um, hibernators have. Uh, I, I'm quite friendly with an American colleague who happens to live in a swanky bit of Hollywood and in Los Angeles, and Ridley Scott lived just down the road. So I managed to get his um, private address. And I wrote him what I thought was an entertaining and witty letter um, suggesting that um, his film was one of the most brilliant I'd seen, but was scientifically inaccurate on the subject of human hibernation. And would he like to hire me as a consultant on his next film so that we can get some of the biology right? Uh, but sadly, he, he didn't respond. Um, I don't know why, but there you are. <laughs> so um, finally, um, I'm not going to list all the people that have been involved in this work, um, but I will list the organizations. Of course, the University of Manchester, which has been my home for um, quite a long time now, um, the BBSRC have been absolutely magnificent. They've supplied me with a continuous unbroken stream of funding for more than 25 years, in fact. And I'm hugely grateful um, to, to, the, to that organization for what it's been able to do for the, the careers of many, many biologists um, in the country. And the Human Frontiers um, Science Program has also supported particularly the work on hibernation and I hold funding also from the, uh, the Wellcome Trust as well.